I was speaking yesterday to a group of young people over in Murfield. I was invited to go and uh, give a, a talk to what they call Yorkshire Youth, which is a recent thing that's been set up for teenagers in uh, this area, and it was a, it was a good occasion. And uh, I, was, I was asked to speak to them about the subject of faith, and I, I chose to speak from Hebrews 11, where the writer says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because everyone who wants to come to him must believe he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's a great verse there. And as I was speaking to these young people, probably they were, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 kind of age, I was really just struck, even as I spoke to them, with this thought that here are these young people, and as far as we know, they've got their lives stretched out ahead of them, and they're, they're on the, the verge of stepping into adulthood, really. And some of them have plans for their future, and others of them don't really know what's going to happen and what they want to do with their lives. But whatever the rest of their days on earth hold for these young people, it just struck me powerfully, and it ought to always strike us, and I hope it struck them, there would be nothing better for those young people than to spend every day of their life following Jesus Christ with a passion. That's the best life, and I tried to say that to them. Every other aim, goal in life that you maybe are encouraged to live for, that will ultimately, without Christ as the centre of it all, that will ultimately be a wasted life. And what I aim to impress on them, I want to impress on you too, because it's not just for young people, is it? Anything less than a life lived with Christ at the absolute centre is to sell life itself short. It's not what we were made for. We were made to know him, to follow him, to enjoy him, to love him, to obey him. A life lived in pursuit of the Saviour. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that he exists, but not just believe he exists, but that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's life, earnestly seeking God in Christ. But sometimes other things appear better than that pursuit. Sometimes other things crowd in, or other things tempt us away from that pursuit, that glorious pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe for you right now, something might be appearing better to you. But the truth is, that we always need to come back to, is that a life lived for some other end will ultimately be a life not lived with anything but wastefulness in the end. And of course, neither I nor the writer to the Hebrews, nor of course God himself wants you to ever live such a life, but to live a life with the meaning and purpose that you were created for. So... Is Christ then the very goal of your life, the person? I don't mean the doctrines we believe about him, important though those are, but I'm saying is your focus on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, to know him, as Paul says, I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Do you want that? Or are you just simply believing things about him? Are you, as it were, just sort of floating along in the, in the current or are you swimming strongly towards him, even if it means going against the current sometimes? Until you know you have him and you won't let go of him. That's life. You don't need to be a young person to need to get this right. If you're in your 80s, your 70s, or your 60s, or your 50s, or your 40s, or your 30s, it's the same, isn't it, for all of you? It's the same for me. So tonight I want to simply reiterate what the writer of the Hebrews often seems to want to repeat, that the Lord Jesus Christ is better than anything. We've seen that as we've gone to Hebrews, haven't we? He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the whole priestly system. And here we've come to it again uh, this afternoon. And it, the rubber hits the road when we say, well, are there functionally things in my life which I treat as better than him? Or do I want him more than anything? And I want us to ask, well, how then do we go about cultivating that supreme love for and pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, three things that you need to do according to this passage at the end of chapter 9. The first thing is, don't settle for copies. 
Don't settle for copies. The second thing is, don't live on repeat. And the third thing is, don't forget your future. Okay? Don't settle for copies. Don't live on repeat. Don't forget your future. That's where we're going this evening. First thing, how do we make Christ central in the pursuit of him, the highest goal of our life? Well, don't settle for copies. The writer has been talking quite often about the copies of the real things throughout chapters 8 and 9. But he returns to that theme again in verse 23, where he says it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, the Old Testament Levitical sacrifices. In other words, all the stuff, all the furniture and the furnishings in the tabernacle needed to be purified by sprinkling them with blood so that they'd be ready for holy use. We saw something about last time and somebody said to me afterwards, you were right when you said there'd be a, little, a lot of blood <laughs> last time and there was. Because the whole thing had to be purified with the blood of, of animals. But the point he's making, the writer, is that all of that was just, of course, a copy and a shadow of what really needed to happen for sinners like me and like you to progress to making our home in heaven one day. We needed Christ's blood, which is spoken of here in a kind of general parallel with the old covenant system as better sacrifices. Is the heavenly things needed to be purified with better sacrifices than these old ones. And it doesn't mean Christ made many, many sacrifices, as we'll go and see, but it's just a kind of general way of speaking to compare the two systems. The better sacrifices refers to Christ's death for us. And that sacrifice has made the dwelling of a holy God suitably prepared for people who would otherwise define it. That's what he means when he says that the heavenly things needed to be purified, made ready for the entrance of, of uh, sinners into a holy place. That could only be done by Christ's death. And so you can go to heaven when you pass out of this life because Christ's death was not a copy of something that really did have purifying power, but it was the real thing that has the purifying power to remove our sin actually, to cleanse our consciences and to allow us to enter the place where a holy God dwells and only holy things or holy people can be. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. No, he entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. So even now, he's there for us. And even beyond that life which we spend with him in heaven, even beyond that is a, a life better than even that when we shall be raised from the dead live in a new creation, as we'll go on to see in a few moments. But the point here is that Christ's death deals in terms of realities. Christ's salvation is about the real thing, not copies, and certainly not make-believe. Because we want to deal with real things, even in normal life, don't we? Rather than just copies. Sometimes a copy can help, sometimes a picture of something has its place, but you know, I for what you know, I've, I've got photos of you lot. Okay, I've got church photos which I have up in my study to remind me of you because I love you and because I love being with you. But I'd much rather be with you than hug the picture. <laughs> I'd much rather have the real people and be with you and eat and drink with you and be around the table with you and worship with you and sing with you than just have the photo, wouldn't I? I'd much rather have my wife and my children gathered around me than hold some plasticine models of them, which they made for me to take away. And I would rather have an actual, real, flesh and blood Jesus, a living saviour, rather have that than some weak imitation of him. Wouldn't you? You want the real thing, don't you? I hope you do. Not just a copy. The problem is, is that I know... Again, I for one, I don't doubt perhaps at times you too. Times where in my folly I settle for 
copies over against the real thing, over against the real Christ. Maybe you maybe you indulge in some sin that promises pleasure that you know will be momentary, but you still indulge in it. Do you know what that sin is trying to do? Is trying to copy the real thing, because in Christ there is pleasure beyond what this world can offer. The psalmist say, "Fullness of joy is in your presence," and every temptation to sin kind of is a parasite on that real pleasure that Christ is. We were built for that. We were designed to have joy and sin says, I can offer you that, you know. And it says, just bypass Christ. And you can have that, that joy, but it's not real. It's a copy. It's a fake. It's a phony. But we can settle for it, and we shouldn't. We should say, ah, oh, this is tempting me to to in, enjoy myself. Well, I've got a better enjoyment. It comes to mind what C.S. Lewis once said about children who, who think that it's uh, better to make mud pies in a slum because they've never been offered a holiday at the seaside. They think they're having fun here when actually something far better is offered them. And that's our salvation in Christ. We're not to say, oh, I'm enjoying making my mud pies. It's great. It's great fun. Oh, there's, it's, a, it's a greater joy to be had. There's, a, there's an overwhelming pleasure to be had in Christ, which, which puts all that pleasure in the shade. So don't settle for copies. Or maybe it's not pleasure, the pleasure of sin. Maybe it's that you, you feel you need to kind of find some way of feeling safe and secure in your life. And other things offer that. Maybe you, you, you feel you need to be secure by having enough money. Or maybe you need to feel secure by finding a friend who will give their approval to a decision that you are trying to make. Or maybe you need to feel secure by receiving news from your doctor that at last they found a treatment that's actually going to work. And you're looking for your safety and security in this, that or the other. In some ways... <coughs> Those can all be good things and have their place in life. But if you are using those as copies, as replacements for the only true place to find lasting security and safety, the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're settling for copies. Money and good health and a good treatment for your illness and a friend and whatever it is, that's all okay, but try and rest your weight finally on them and they will buckle and crack under the burden. They can't cope with that, but he can. So we go to him, we don't set up for copies. We find our rest and our security in Christ. So that's the, the first thing I think the writer is saying to us. Drawing on the, the copies of the old covenant system, I think we can draw that into our own lives and say, don't settle for anything that is just a, a, a shadow of the true joy, the true security, the true rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't settle for copies. That's the first way to really um, pursue him and know that he's at the centre of everything. Don't settle for copies. Second thing, don't live on repeat. Don't live on repeat. I'm going to have to explain this one perhaps a little bit. When I was at university, I lived um, for two years in a student house, a big house that had... I think six bedrooms and uh, with other students I lived there with five other students on three floors in Aberystwyth where I went to university and I had a great time there but one of those years I lived on the very top floor the third floor up in the well, second floor isn't it of a three floor building the top floor it was just me uh, one room and there was a landing and across the landing there was another guy whose name was Nathan he was a lovely Christian guy who um, I shared the top floor with. And like many students, Nathan loved to listen to music in his room as he studied. And I didn't mind hearing uh, music, Nathan's music. He had decent enough taste. That was fine. And as I worked away, I could often hear the music from his room wafting across the landing into my room. But I remember one day that for whatever reason, Nathan had fixed on one particular song that he really liked. 
It was called Cannonball by Damien Rice. It doesn't matter if you've never heard of it, it's just imprinted on my memory because Nathan had set up his audio system to play it on a loop, literally, on repeat, over and over and over again. He did that, and then, without remembering to turn it off, he went out <laughs> and left it still play. I didn't actually realise he'd gone. I thought he was just enjoying the song over and over. But after listening to it myself, as I was working in my room for probably more than 100 times, it drove me slightly crazy. I can still sing the chorus to you, I won't do it for you now, but it's just there in my head. There's nothing much fun, is there, about experiencing the same thing over and over and over, even if there's something kind of good about it, once you repeat it over and over and over for hours or days or years, perhaps, that's no fun. But that was the exact experience of the old covenant people of God. They experienced the same thing on repeat, over and over, for years, even centuries, amazingly enough. That's what we're told in verse 25. And this is how Christ is better than the old system. It says that Christ did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Just the same thing they had to do every single year that was sacrificed on repeat. Well, that was just crying out for someone to, as it were, cross the landing and shout, Turn it off! We don't want it anymore. It's too much. But no one could turn it off. Not as long as there were sinners in the world. And there needed to be a way of paying for sins, but a saviour had not yet come. They just needed to keep doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, over, over, over again. Because sin needs paying for. People keep sinning, they still need to pay for it. But the very repetition of the sacrifices showed, as I think we've seen often before in Hebrews, that it didn't really work. The payment was inadequate. When we repeat something, that shows that you can't just do it once. It's not good enough to do something once. Wouldn't it be nice to put your dirty clothes in the washing machine once and then never have to wash them again? That would be great, wouldn't it? But you can't do that because they keep getting dirty. It would be nice. I don't know what you feel about this, but I would love to be able to go to the barbers and say, please just cut my hair exactly the right way and then, I'll, and then just leave it at that length and I don't want to have to come back again. Would that, that would be good, wouldn't it? Because it would just be the way you like it. If it doesn't want to, it just keeps growing. You have to keep going back. It's not good enough to just go once. Hair keeps growing, clothes get dirty again, and sin is kind of the same. It just keeps growing, and it keeps making things dirty again. And however many Old Testament sacrifices uh, were, were an attempt, as it were, of dealing with that, they couldn't solve that problem. They couldn't stop sin growing. They couldn't stop it making things dirty over and over again. But Jesus could. Jesus could. Verse 25. He didn't enter heaven to offer himself again and again. He didn't. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood on his own. No, his salvation is better because it's not on repeat. It is absolutely once for all. If his blood had had that same temporary effect as all the animal sacrifices then not only would he had to be sacrificed over and over and over again for every time one of his people sinned, he would have actually had to have been doing that since the very beginning of history, the writer says. From the earliest time people started sinning, verse 26. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. See, as soon as Adam sinned, right, I've got to get in there and die for him. And then someone else sins, Eve sins, and she I have to get in and die for her. And then Seth sins, and then Abel sins, and then someone else sins, and someone else sins. And every time, Christ would have to go and die for them, if that's how it works. But it's not how it works with Christ. He's appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what it says in verse 26. Once for all. All the sin of God's Old Testament people heaped up, as it were, held in reserve for Christ, 
till he should come and then dumped on him, loaded onto him on the cross. And all the sin of the people who were yet to come in God's mind, who can see all time and all space at one glance, all of that sin to put back onto Christ, pays for it all, once for all. Your sins, past sins, present sins, and the sins who are yet to commit all in one go onto Christ. What a weight. How could he bear it? But he did, he has done, and it's done. Done away with. No more sin to pay for. He has, isn't this a wonderful phrase? He has done away with sin. It's just over. No longer has any claim on any of God's people from Adam to the last person who'll ever be saved before Christ comes again. That's it. Great news, isn't it? There was once a doctor who lived in a, a rural village quite some years ago. He was known for both his professional skill on the one hand and also for his devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these were the days before the NHS when patients actually had to pay the doctor for the treatment they received. And in the end, after the doctor lived a long life treating many people, uh, he died. And after he died, uh, his record books were examined. I don't know whether it's part of his will or how it was done, but it was discovered um, afterwards that he had several entries in his record books of the visits he'd made to people as a doctor, where he'd written across the entry of their treatment in red ink these words, forgiven, too poor to pay. It's written across, forgiven, too poor to pay. They couldn't pay, so he said, not going to charge you. However, after his death, the doctor's wife, who outlived him, was not best pleased about this arrangement. And she insisted that these debts actually be settled, and went so far as to take the case to court to try and reclaim the money that the husband had not demanded of these people who were too poor to pay. <clears throat> but when the case was heard, the judge got her on the stand and, and answered this question, Here's his record book. Is this your husband's handwriting in red? And she replied that it was. Then, said the judge, not a court in the land can touch those whom he has forgiven. End of story. Right, do you understand? If Christ's death is once for all, then it's once for all for all your sins and all my sins. And not a court in the land, and not a court in heaven or in hell, can ever touch those whom Christ has written in his own blood, forgiven. Are you living in the freedom of that truth? Even Satan can't touch you. Even God, the just judge, will never turn against you. As we read in Romans 8 earlier. Who is there to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. No one will overcome his sacrifice. It's done. It's over. We're forgiven. And no one can bring it back against us to set against us for condemnation. Live in the freedom of that truth. Don't live on repeat, I'm saying. Well, what does that mean? What I mean is thinking that when you sin, because you still will, that when you sin, even though you know Christ has died, that you still somehow need to make up for it with some kind of obedient act. That just like the people in the old covenant knew that when they committed a sin, they had to do something about it. They had to bring another lamb. Commit another sin, bring another lamb. Commit another sin, bring another lamb. Just like that. I've seen I've got to do something about it. I've seen I've got to do something else about it. Try to make up for it again. Try to make up for it again. Try to make up for it again. To live like that today, when we're under the new covenant, that is to totally fail to realise that there is a lamb who has been slain, who does away with all sin forever. And you no longer need to say, well, Lord, I sinned yesterday, so I better behave today. That is to live on repeat. That is to deny the sacrifice of Christ for you. That is to diminish the glory of the Saviour of the world. To give him the utmost glory we say, I believe you, 
I come to you, yes I've sinned, I repent, I turn away from it and I just trust entirely in what you have done, not in what I might or might do tomorrow. Not in how I can make it up to you. You can't make it up to him. He has done everything for you. Let him do it. Not a court in heaven or on earth or in hell you can touch the person whom Jesus has forgiven. Remember, don't live on repeat. Okay, so don't settle for copies. Don't live on repeat. And thirdly, don't forget your future. That's the third way of living in true pursuit of Christ at the centre. Don't forget your future. See, one of the wonderful, wonderful things about this is that his salvation isn't yet over, actually. It's not yet finally complete. Yes, the sacrifice of Christ is once for all, and yet the salvation which he has earned us at the cross is still awaiting its final consummation, its final perfection. But you see, there is this final way of unwittingly denying that truth, unwittingly treating something else as better than Christ and better than this, this salvation that he brings. You can think that what you have now is in fact the sum total of the salvation Christ intends for you. That is not true. What you have now is just the beginning. What you have now is <clears throat> not the whole, not the complete picture. Yes, we have complete forgiveness in him, forever. Yes, we have nothing ever more to pay for our salvation. Yes, we do not need to turn to anything else for our pleasure or our rest or our satisfaction or our safety. But still, even that is not the whole of it. Christ is better than everything, not only for all those reasons, but also because even this wonderful salvation still, still awaits its final glorification. What we've got now is glorious and wonderful, but as, again, I think C.S. Lewis put it in one of his Narnia books, it's, it's like opening a book, we've just got the, the title page and the, no, the front cover and the title page. That's, that's, that's the bit we're in at the moment. We've not even begun chapter one of the, of the book. We've just got the start. Or you might say, what we have now is like going into a grand mansion where there's a feast awaiting us, but we're just in the porch and we're just taking our coat off. That's this life. We're yet to really go in and we will go in when he comes again because that's what the writer says in verse 27 and verse 28 he says just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him you might think hold on I thought he brought salvation well yes he did but he's still going to save them even more completely and fully and finally then. The writer is saying there is a certain progression to the destiny of every human being. It's not just we live and then we die, end of story. No, he says people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. Seeing then, he says, that Christ is also a true human being who stepped into our humanity, Truly and genuinely, he too will go through the same sequence. He died. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, verse 28. And then he too will come to them judgment, just as every other human being will. He will appear a second time. You see, he's not coming to be judged as we are. He's coming to be the judge. He says, not to bear sin. But, ah, oh, now we need to stop. Because it doesn't say... He will come then to judge the world. Though that's true. It says he will come to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Because you see, that's part of the judgment. When he comes the second time, he comes not to pay for sin, he comes to judge sin. He comes to judge sin in, in us. He comes to remove sin completely from us. He comes to, to finally lay the, the absolute death blow upon all our sin. So no longer is it just that we are delivered from its guilt and its power as we are in this life, but also its presence forevermore. That will be his judgment upon sin. And looked at it from the opposite way, the writer says then that, that will be salvation. That will be ultimate deliverance and that will be brought to us who are waiting for him. So don't forget your future. 
Don't fail to live in the pursuit of Christ by thinking, well, what I've got now is basically it. No, you think, oh, there's, more to, there's more to have, there's more to pursue, there's more to discover, and finally, to aim for that day, to press forward towards the goal for which Christ has called me heavenward. There's more to this life. And there's another life to enjoy with him too. That will keep you going, that will keep you focused on Christ. Whatever happens, through thick and thin, as countless Christians down the centuries have testified. Let me just give you one example of that. A man who suffered greatly and yet kept his eyes fixed on the future. You may have heard of him. His name was Paul Gerhardt. He was a 17th century German pastor. And he's probably most famous for writing the hymn, O Sacred Head, Sore Wounded. You may even know that one. But uh, what you might have known, which I think I'd forgotten before I, I read about him this week, is that he was uh, involved in what was called the Thirty Years' War in uh, Europe at that time. Um, not involved as a soldier, but, but wrapped up in all the suffering and trauma that came about as a result of that awful war in that part of Europe at the time. And, um, there was a point at which he and his family were forced to flee from their home. So this guy's not kind of writing... Uh, beautiful hymns in some ivory tower somewhere. He was literally running for his life with his family. <clears throat> and one night, as they were on the road fleeing for their safety, they stayed in a small village inn. They were homeless, they were afraid, and his wife finally came to kind of breaking point. She broke down and she just wept in despair at their terrible lot. And Gerhard sought to comfort her and reminded her of the Bible's promises about God's love and provision and keeping. But even as he did that, he went outside for some fresh air himself and he too could no longer cope and broke down and wept himself in the garden of the inn where he was staying. And felt he had come to his darkest hour of his life. But even as he wept and prayed there, he sensed uh, the grace of God upon him and something of the burden lifted and he felt anew again the Lord's presence and being Paul Gerhardt, he went inside and wrote a hymn. And this one's not so well known, but it has brought comfort to many like him since. It says this, Give to the winds thy fears, hope and be undismayed. God hears thy sighs and counts thy tears. God shall lift up thy head. Through waves and clouds and storms, he gently clears the way. Wait thou his time. So shall the night soon end in joyous day. Paul Gerhardt didn't forget his future. So shall the night soon end in joyous day. It's not all that there is to have in Christ. Pursue yet more, for one day he's coming again. We shall see him face to face. May Christ, the whole God, centre and aim of your life. Then. Let's pray together. Father, help me and help us all not to settle for copies of the joy and pleasure that Christ gives. Lord, help us not to live on repeat as if we needed to make some sacrifice ourselves to make up for sins that we have done and to realise Christ has done it all. Help us not to forget our future. Christ shall come again and make all well once and for all. Lord, we pray that our lives will be lives lived in pursuit of Christ, that we will not just believe that you exist, that Christ is risen from the dead, but that we may earnestly seek you and believe that you reward such faith. May that be true of all of us. We might not live wasted life, but rather full, flourishing, holy, useful lives for your glory. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.